I got to know that the school is accredited as the best communication school in Asia. The school is accredited or has got some collaboration with uh, recognized international institutions. And that was the major drive for me to come here. The program that has been designed to create high quality of graduates has become the reasons why students need to study at LSPR Jakarta. I guarantee that you will have better time in studying and also have a lot of things to learn in order to prepare yourself for the future. LSPR has always embraced new developments in information technology, how it has changed and continues to change our lives. LSPR Bali is our center for LSPR e-learning, a living demonstration of our commitment to staying at the cutting edge of education. LSPR e-learning or online learning enables students to study with flexibility and to personalize their program to save time and achieve more. LSPR e-learning gives everyone the freedom to take a bachelor's degree in public relations and marketing communication anytime, anywhere. LSPR Bali also offers short courses in public relations. With its strong international ties, Bali is the ideal location for LSPR to teach public relations professionals how to be more competitive in today's global era. LSPR does more than provide an education. We actively help our alumni to find great career opportunities. Our Careers and Employability Center gives them career advice and helps link them up with almost a thousand local and international strategic corporate partners. LSPR is also the Secretariat Office of the ASEAN Public Relations Network and ASEAN Autism Network. LSPR's Careers and Employability Center partners with Indonesia's Hotel General Managers Association as well as with Indonesian embassies in countries that host LSPR students in their internship programs. We also help and encourage our students to thrive in many non-academic activities. As a result, LSPR students have achieved an outstanding level of success in many national and international competitions. LSPR graduate students gain a nationally recognized professional certification through Lembaga Certificasi Profesi and other professional certification bodies. All these factors combine to ensure LSPR alumni achieve an outstanding level of success in their careers and are sought after by many companies. A prestigious new landmark to the east of Jakarta. The location is highly strategic, just 100 meters from East Bekasi KRL station, 100 meters from the bus station, and a five-minute Transpark shuttle ride from the LRT station. Transpark Juanda is a new masterpiece in the form of a modern all-round superblock, combining residential, entertainment, office, and education functions all in one place all seamlessly integrated under the concept of live, play, work, study. And the London School of Public Relations occupies a 12-story campus with cutting-edge facilities, including a TV, radio, and music studio, a multimedia and editing suite, a research center, computer... Hi, are we studying soon? ...a library, auditorium, theater, drama room, Hi, Prof. Um, so actually, we put in the rundown. The registration would be from 1 to 1.30 Jakarta time. Oh, okay. So we'll start at 2.30 here. Yes, correct. Okay. Okay, then let me do other things for 20 minutes. Thank you, Professor. Quality educational institution with truly premium facilities. We will continue to go the extra mile to deliver educational excellence in Indonesia and abroad. LSPR was established in 1992 
We began with short PR courses. By 2001, we'd achieved grade A accreditation and have recognized international standard. LSPR is committed to providing premium quality education. We've graduated many successful alumni and collaborated with more than 50 universities, partners, and organizations around the world. LSPR strives to deliver better and better education by harnessing advances in technology and practical learning in a creative and dynamic environment. Our undergraduate program includes international examinations in partnership with Edith Cohen University, Australia, Northumbria University, UK, City and Guilds UK, LCCI UK, and The Hague University of the Netherlands. Our postgraduate program gives successful professionals the chance to enhance their knowledge by studying various international subjects. The LSPR postgraduate program cooperates with Edith Cohen University Australia, City and Guilds UK, and Coventry University UK. I got to know that the school is accredited as the best communication school in Indonesia. The school is accredited or has got some collaboration with uh, recognized international institutions and that was the major drive for me to come here. The program that has been designed to create high quality of graduates has become the reasons why students need to study at LSPR Jakarta. I guarantee that you will have better time in studying and also have a lot of things to learn in order to prepare yourself for the future. LSPR has always embraced new developments in information technology, how it has changed and continues to change our lives. LSPR Bali is our center for LSPR e-learning, a living demonstration of our commitment to staying at the cutting edge of education. LSPR e-learning, or online learning, enables students to study with flexibility and to personalize their program to save time and achieve more. LSPR e-learning gives everyone the freedom to take a bachelor's degree in public relations and marketing communication anytime, anywhere. LSPR Bali also offers short courses in public relations. With its strong international ties, Bali is the ideal location for LSPR to teach public relations professionals how to be more competitive in today's global era. LSPR does more than provide an education. We actively help our alumni to find great career opportunities. Our careers and employability center gives them career advice and helps link them up with almost a thousand local and international strategic corporate partners. LSPR is also the secretariat office of the ASEAN Public Relations Network and ASEAN Autism Network. LSPR's Careers and Employability Center partners with Indonesia's Hotel General Managers Association, as well as with Indonesian embassies in countries that host LSPR students in their internship programs. We also help and encourage our students to thrive in many non-academic activities. As a result, LSPR students have achieved an outstanding level of success in many national and international competitions. LSPR graduate students gain a nationally recognized professional certification through Lembaga Certificasi Profesi and other professional certification bodies. All these factors combine to ensure LSPR alumni achieve an outstanding level of success in their careers and are sought after by many companies. A prestigious new landmark to the east of Jakarta. The location is highly strategic, just 100 meters from East Bekasi KRL station, 100 meters from the bus station, and a five minute transport shuttle ride from the LRT station. Transpark Juanda is a new masterpiece in the form of a modern all-round superblock, combining residential, entertainment, office, and education functions all in one place, all seamlessly integrated under the concept of live, play, work, study. And the London School of Public Relations occupies a 12-story campus with cutting-edge facilities, including a TV, radio, and music studio, a multimedia and editing suite, 
a research center, computer and English laboratories, a library, auditorium, theater, drama room. LSPR Transpark in Juanda Complex, Bacassi is one of the most complete campuses in the world with some of the best facilities. There's an eco park, modern apartments, a mall, cafes, fitness centers, supermarkets, cinemas, and many more. LSPR Transpark is an international top quality educational institution with truly premium facilities. We will continue to go the extra mile to deliver educational excellence in Indonesia and abroad. LSPR was established in 1992. We began with short PR courses. By 2001, we'd achieved grade A accreditation and have recognized the international standard. LSPR is committed to providing premium quality education. We've graduated many successful alumni and collaborated with more than 50 universities, partners, and organizations around the world. LSPR strives to deliver better and better education by harnessing advances in technology and practical learning in a creative and dynamic environment. Our undergraduate program includes international examinations in partnership with Edith Cohen University, Australia, Northumbria University, UK, City and Guilds UK, LCCI UK, and The Hague University of the Netherlands. Our postgraduate program gives successful professionals the chance to enhance their knowledge by studying various international subjects. The LSPR postgraduate program cooperates with Edith Cohen University Australia, City and Guilds UK, and Coventry University UK. I got to know that the school is accredited as the best communication school in Indonesia. The school is accredited or has got some collaboration with uh, recognized international institutions and that was the major drive for me to come here. The program that has been designed to create high quality of graduates has become the reasons why students need to study at LSPR Jakarta. I guarantee that you will have better time in studying and also have a lot of things to learn in order to prepare yourself for the future. LSPR has always embraced new developments in information technology, how it has changed and continues to change our lives. LSPR Bali is our center for LSPR e-learning, a living demonstration of our commitment to staying at the cutting edge of education. LSPR e-learning, or online learning, enables students to study with flexibility and to personalize their program to save time and achieve more. LSPR e-learning gives everyone the freedom to take a bachelor's degree in public relations and marketing communication anytime, anywhere. LSPR Bali also offers short courses in public relations. With its strong international ties, Bali is the ideal location for LSPR to teach public relations professionals how to be more competitive in today's global era. LSPR does more than provide an education. We actively help our alumni to find great career opportunities. Our careers and employability center gives them career advice and helps link them up with almost a thousand local and international strategic corporate partners. LSPR is also the Secretariat Office of the ASEAN Public Relations Network and ASEAN Autism Network. LSPR's Careers and Employability Center partners with Indonesia's Hotel General Managers Association, as well as with Indonesian embassies in countries that host LSPR students in their internship programs. 
We also help and encourage our students to thrive in many non-academic activities. As a result, LSBR students have achieved an outstanding level of success in many national and international competitions. LSPR graduate students gain a nationally recognized professional certification through La Maga Certificasi Profesi and other professional certification bodies. All these factors combine to ensure LSPR alumni achieve an outstanding level of success in their careers and are sought after by many companies. A prestigious new landmark to the east of Jakarta. The location is highly strategic, just 100 meters from East Bekasi KRL station, 100 meters from the bus station, and a five-minute transport shuttle ride from the LRT station. Transpark Juanda is a new masterpiece in the form of a modern all-round superblock, combining residential, entertainment, office, and education functions all in one place all seamlessly integrated under the concept of live, play, work, study. And the London School of Public Relations occupies a 12-storey campus with cutting-edge facilities, including a TV, radio and music studio, a multimedia and editing suite, a research centre, computer and English laboratories, a library, auditorium, theatre, drama room, LSPR Transpark in Juanda Complex Bekasi is one of the most complete campuses in the world with some of the best facilities. There's an eco park, modern apartments, a mall, cafes, fitness centers, supermarkets, cinemas, and many more. LSPR Transpark is an international, top quality educational institution with truly premium facilities. We will continue to go the extra mile to deliver educational excellence in Indonesia and abroad. LSPR was established in 1992. We began with short PR courses. By 2001, we'd achieved grade A accreditation and a recognized international standard. LSPR is committed to providing premium quality education. We've graduated many successful alumni and collaborated with more than 50 universities, partners, and organizations around the world. LSPR strives to deliver better and better education by harnessing advances in technology and practical learning in a creative and dynamic environment. Our undergraduate program includes international examinations in partnership with Edith Cohen University, Australia, Northumbria University, UK, City and Guilds UK, LCCI UK, and The Hague University of the Netherlands. Our postgraduate program gives successful professionals the chance to enhance their knowledge by studying various international subjects. The LSPR postgraduate program cooperates with Edith Cohen University Australia, City and Guilds UK, and Coventry University UK. I got to know that the school is accredited as the best communication school in Indonesia. The school is accredited or has got some collaboration with uh, recognized international institutions and that was the major drive for me to come here. The program that has been designed to create high quality of graduates has become the reasons why students need to study at LSPR Jakarta. I guarantee that you will have better time in studying and also have a lot of things to learn in order to prepare yourself for the future. LSPR has always embraced new developments in information technology, how it has changed and continues to change our lives. LSPR Bali is our center for LSPR e-learning, a living demonstration of our commitment to staying at the cutting edge of education. LSPR e-learning, or online learning, enables students to study with flexibility and to personalize their program to save time and achieve more. 
LSPR eLearning gives everyone the freedom to take a bachelor's degree in public relations and marketing communication anytime, anywhere. LSPR Bali also offers short courses in public relations. With its strong international ties, Bali is the ideal location for LSPR to teach public relations professionals how to be more competitive in today's global era. LSPR does more than provide an education. We actively help our alumni to find great career opportunities. Our Careers and Employability Center gives them career advice and helps link them up with almost a thousand local and international strategic corporate partners. LSPR is also the Secretariat Office of Network and ASEAN Autism Network. LSPR's Careers and Employability Center partners with Indonesia's Hotel General Managers Association. With Indonesian embassies in countries that host LSPR students in their internship programs. We also help and encourage our students to thrive in many non-academic activities. As a result, LSPR students have achieved an outstanding level of success in many national and international competitions. LSPR graduate students gain a nationally recognized professional certification through Lembaga Certificasi Profesi and other professional certification bodies. All these factors combine to ensure LSPR alumni achieve an outstanding level of success in their careers and are sought after by many companies. A prestigious new landmark to the east of Jakarta. The location is highly strategic, just 100 meters from East Bekasi KRL station, 100 meters from the bus station, and a five minute transport shuttle ride from the LRT station. Transport Juanda is a new masterpiece in the form of a modern all-round superblock, combining residential, entertainment, office, and education functions all in one place. All seamlessly integrated under the concept of live, play, work, study. And the London School of Public Relations occupies a 12-story campus with cutting-edge facilities, including a TV, radio, and music studio, a multimedia and editing suite, a research center, computer and English laboratories, a library, auditorium, theater, drama room. LSPR Transpark in Juanda Complex Bekasi is one of the most complete campuses in the world with some of the best facilities. There's an eco park, modern apartments, a mall, cafes, fitness centers, supermarkets, cinemas, and many more. LSPR Transpark is an international top quality educational institution with truly premium facilities. We will continue to go the extra mile to deliver educational excellence in Indonesia and abroad. LSPR was established in 1992. We began with short PR courses. By 2001, we'd achieved grade A accreditation and a recognized international standard. LSPR is committed to providing premium quality education. We've graduated many successful alumni and collaborated with more than 50 universities, partners, and organizations around the world. LSPR strives to deliver better and better education by harnessing advances in technology and practical learning in a creative and dynamic environment. Our undergraduate program includes international examinations in partnership with Edith Cohen University, Australia, Northumbria University, UK, City and Guilds UK, LCCI UK, and The Hague University of the Netherlands. Our postgraduate program gives successful professionals the chance to enhance their knowledge by studying various international subjects. The LSPR postgraduate program cooperates with Edith Cohen University Australia, City and Guilds UK, 
and Coventry University UK. I got to know that the school is accredited as the best communication school in Indonesia. The school is accredited or has got some collaboration with uh, recognized international institutions and that was the major drive for me to come here. The program that has been designed to create high quality of graduates has become the reasons why students need to study at LSPR Jakarta. I guarantee that you will have better time in studying and also have a lot of things to learn in order to prepare yourself for the future. LSPR has always embraced new developments in information technology, how it has changed and continues to change our lives. LSPR Bali is our center for LSPR e-learning, a living demonstration of our commitment to staying at the cutting edge of education. LSPR e-learning, or online learning, enables students to study with flexibility and to personalize their program to save time and achieve more. LSPR e-learning gives everyone the freedom to take a bachelor's degree in public relations and marketing communication anytime, anywhere. LSPR Bali also offers short courses in public relations. With its strong international ties, Bali is the ideal location for LSPR to teach public relations professionals how to be more competitive in today's global era. LSPR does more than provide an education. We actively help our alumni to find great career opportunities. Our Careers and Employability Center gives them career advice and helps link them up with almost a thousand local and international strategic corporate partners. LSPR is also the Secretariat Office of the ASEAN Public Relations Network and ASEAN Autism Network. LSPR's Careers and Employability Center partners with Indonesia's Hotel General Managers Association as well as with Indonesian embassies in countries that host LSPR students in their internship programs. We also help and encourage our students to thrive in many non-academic activities. As a result, LSPR students have achieved an outstanding level of success in many national and international competitions. LSPR graduate students gain a nationally recognized professional certification through Lembaga Certificasi Profesi and other professional certification bodies. All these factors combine to ensure LSPR alumni achieve an outstanding level of success in their careers and are sought after by many companies. A prestigious new landmark to the east of Jakarta. The location is highly strategic, just 100 meters from East Bekasi KRL station, 100 meters from the bus station and a five minute Transpark shuttle ride from the LRT station. Transpark Juanda is a new masterpiece in the form of a modern all-round superblock, combining residential, entertainment, office and education functions all in one place, all seamlessly integrated under the concept of live, play, work, study. And the London School of Public Relations occupies a 12-storey campus with cutting-edge facilities, including a TV, radio and music studio, a multimedia and editing suite, a research centre, computer and English laboratories, a library, auditorium, theatre, drama room, LSPR Transpark in Juanda Complex Bekasi is one of the most complete campuses in the world with some of the best facilities. There's an eco park, modern apartments, a mall, cafes, fitness centers, supermarkets, cinemas, and many more. LSPR Transpark is an international top quality educational institution with truly premium facilities. We will continue to go the extra mile to deliver educational excellence in Indonesia and abroad. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to International Guest Lecture Session with the topic Sustainability as a Major Trend in Consumer Behavior. 
My name is Stefani Leonardo and it is an honor for me to be your moderator for today. First of all, I would like to welcome Dr. Honoris Causa Prita Kemalgani, MBA, MCIPR, APR, FIPR, the CEO and founder of LSPR Institute of Communication and Business. I would also like to welcome our beloved Dean of Business Faculty, Mrs. Yuliana Riana Prasetyawati MM. Good afternoon, Dean Anna. And I would also like to especially welcome our guest lecturer and speaker for today, Professor Sumit Agarwal from National University of Singapore. Welcome, Professor Agarwal, and thank you for your time today. Also, welcome to Ms. Jacqueline C, Head of Strategic Relations at NUS Business School, and for Ms. Deba Chan, Strategic Relations at NUS Business School. Thank you for this opportunity. Last but not least, I would like to welcome all LSPR management, lecturers, staff, and all Londoners for attending our session today. Before we start our session, I would like to kindly request all participants to turn on your camera and also mute your microphone throughout the discussion period. If you have any question, you can put your question in the chat box and we will discuss it during the Q&A session. Now, to start our session, I would like to invite our Dean of Business Faculty, Mrs. Yuliana Riana Prasetyawati MM, to give an opening speech. Dean Anna, the screen is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Miss Stephanie, as the moderator today. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera buat kita semua. Om Swastiastu, Nabo Budaya, Salam Kebajikan. The Honorable Founder and CEO LSPR Institute, Ibu Dr. Honoris Kausa, Prita Kemalgani, MBA, MCIPR, APR, FAPR, The Honorable Prof. Samit Argawal from NUS Business School. Welcome, Prof. to LSPR. LSPR Management, the head of the program study and the team, LSPR Lecture, I see, I see in the Zoom, uh, Mem Elke, uh, Mr. Teguh, uh, Mr. Membi. Thank you so much to join in the uh, Zoom. And also, my student and LSPR, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to LSPR International Guest Lecture, hosted by LSPR Faculty of Business. LSPR Institute is an education institution that aims to produce graduates in the field of communication and business who will be able to compete at national and international level. So, LSPR Institute holds several programs to increase the international exposure, uh, exposure to LSPR students. One of them is International Guest Lecture. Today, we are able to hold an international guest lecture, a collaboration between LSPR Faculty of Business and NUS Business School. The speaker today is Prof. Sabit Agarwal from National University of Singapore. Thank you so much, Prof. Sabit Agarwal. It is an honor for us, for LSPR, that Prof. Summit can join uh, to be an amazing speaker in the international guest lecture. Thank you so much, Prof. And uh, today, our lecture and our student international guest lecture, we will learn sustainability as a major trend in consumer behavior. Now, in business field, Sustainability has been a value that consumer activity looking for in the product they use, especially for those who prefer eco-friendly product and product that claim to support sustainability. The threat of climate change is one of the reasons why consumers support sustainability product and eco 
conscious company. And so, therefore, this, this event is a good opportunity for all us to enrich our knowledge about sustainability concept in consumer behavior. Last not but least, uh, I thank you so much to LSPR team, uh, Media Center, International Office, uh, Ms. Ninis, uh, Mr. Mambi and the team, uh, Faculty Business team, uh, Ms. Stephanie, Ms. Mega, Ms. Widya, to preparation this event. Thank you so much and enjoy uh, International Guest Lecture with Prof. Sabit Agawa from the National University of Singapore. Okay, I close my opening speech uh, by Pantun, jalan-jalan ke Indonesia. Jangan lupa membeli batik. Cukup sekian dari saya. Terima kasih dan sehat selalu. Back to moderator, Miss Stephanie. Okay, thank you, Din Anna, for your encouraging speech. Now we will also listen to inspirational speech by the CEO and founder of LSPR Institute, Dr. Honoris Causa Prita Kemalgani, MBA, MCIPR, APR, FIPR. Sorry, it's me or? Uh, we will, we're still waiting for, there is some technical issue, Professor. Okay. Hello, welcome to LSPR International Guest Lectures for the subject consumer behavior and digital consumer behavior. With the topic today, sustainability as a major trend in consumer behavior. Our keynote speaker for today, Professor Sumit Agarwal. Hello, Professor Sumit, the Professor of Economic and Real Estate at the Uni National University of Singapore. Today, December 19, 2023, starting from 1.30 p.m. to 3 p.m. live on Zoom. Also, hello, Dean Yuliana Riana Prastiawati, the Dean of Faculty of Business at LSPR. Why sustainability is the key to business growth? Because sustainability is about creating a better future for ourselves and the generation to come. In accordance to COP28 in Dubai, Bill Gates made wave on his statement on climate change. He is why he is right and what most people miss. Bill Gates said, Planting trees will not solve the climate problems. Better to invest in new technology for carbon removal, clean energy, and electric vehicle to implement policies like carbon taxes that could found future green technology. It doesn't mean planting tree is not good, but still we need to have a new renewable energy It's better. Understanding sustainability, company which practice sustainability will have a better future. By adopting sustainability practice, businesses can reduce their environmental impact, improve their reputation, and even save money. Why sustainability in business important? Sustainability is a business imperative and should be core the strategy and operation of every business. Uh, save the uh, water, not waste the food, not waste the energy. Yeah? Consumers are willing to pay for a premium good of, from brands that are environmentally responsible. For instance, when we're staying in the hotel, like even five-star hotel, we didn't find any more shampoo, conditioner, or body lotion in the bottle. We found them in the big bottles in the bathroom that we can use it every day after other people also using it. This is for sustainability. But still, we are willing to pay 
the same price the hotel price like when we get uh, the free shampoo and conditioner or body lotion also 71% of employees and employment seekers say that environmentally sustainable company are more attractive uh, to the employer now the employer will think if a company care of the environment care of uh, the well-being of uh, the employee then the employee will think that they can count on the company for their future so meaning the company who care of the uh, sustainability waste uh, uh, management uh, water management and you know always uh, think of uh, something efficient then make company can save more then meaning the company will have more future employees are also increasingly looking for mission driven purpose led by employer who care about the planet when deciding where to work so many young people now they um, care where they want to work uh, be, they will work to the company that inspires 80% of consumer indicate that sustainability is important to them this is also important to all of us government investor employee and customer are demanding new level of enterprise accountability including action to address climate change so the investor will give investment to the company who care on the sustainability government will give license or accreditations to the company who also care of the uh, climate change and sustainability many of the world top economies have or are developing a corporate disclosure requirement around environmental impact driving businesses or club GHSG emission so this company will be on the list of the preferable company the rise of environmental and social and governance or ESG investment criteria and sustainability investing means that a sustainable business is inherently more attractive to the rising number of responsible investors remember consumer buy our product not because what we are doing but why we are doing it i think these are all thank you so much professor sumit argawal and dean juliana prastiawati and thank you for students for listening to me and give my attention to me thank you and have a good day and have a good session see you merry christmas and happy new year bye So that is the inspirational speech by Ibu Prita. Before we continue to our main event, I will read the profile of the speaker for today. Professor Sumit Agarwal is Lotu Kuang's Distinguished Professor of Finance at the Business School and a Professor of Economics and Real Estate at the National University of Singapore. He is the Managing Director of Sustainable and Green Finance Institute at NUS. He is also the President of Asian Bureau of Finance and Economic Research. In the past, he has held positions as a Professor of Finance at the Business School, Georgetown University. Before that, he was a Senior Financial Economist in the Research Department at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. And prior to joining the Chicago Fed, he was a senior vice president and credit risk management executive in the Small Business Risk Solutions Group of Bank of America. Sumit's research interests include issues relating to household sustainability, financial institutions, household finance, behavioral finance, and real estate markets. He has published over 125 research articles in economics and finance journals, among others. Additionally, he has co-written four books titled Introduction to Household Financial Management, 
household finance, a functional approach, chiasonomics, and chiasonomics too. And also co-edited two collected volumes titled Impact of COVID-19 on Asian Economies and Policy Responses and Household Credit Usage, Personal Debt, and Mortgage. He writes regular op-eds in the Straits Times and is featured on various media outlets like the BBC, CNBC, and Fox on issues relating to finance, banking, and real estate markets. Sumit's research is widely cited in the leading newspapers and magazines like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, The Economist, and the U.S. President's Report to Congress. He also runs a podcast on household financial decision-making called Kiasonomics. Now, without further ado, let's uh, give the warmest virtual uh, applause to Professor Samit Agarwal. Professor Agarwal, the screen is yours. Ah, thank you very much. I don't think I've ever had that long of an introduction uh, in all these years of presenting, uh, which is <laughs> amazing. Um, uh, so once again, I want to thank Dean Anna, CEO, all the students, especially the students who are making time to come to listen to me. Uh, it puts a lot of pressure on me to kind of make you keep you entertained and tell you a story on sustainability and why sustainability is important from a household perspective. Um, we always think about sustainability from the top-down approach, okay? I, I run a sustainability institute at NUS Business School and the whole thing we just started recently was an entire master's in sustainability program and this is something we have been pushing. We want to create some sustainability professionals all over Asia, especially in Indonesia and, and in, in Malaysia, every country, so that they can go back to their countries coming from our program and kind of become the standard bearers in the fight against sustainability. Okay. Uh, so we, in our current batch, I think we have five or six people in our master's program who are from Indonesia and we want to increase and cultivate this program at NUS Business School. Uh, enough of kind of trying to sell the program. Let me kind of kind of give you guys an idea of what I will present, and then you can judge. Because these are the same slides I use in my sustainability class that I teach uh, in this program. So you can see uh, how these things could be of interest to you guys. Okay. So. Let me try to motivate of what I am trying to say that people typically think of sustainability from a top-down approach, which is that companies and regulators and countries have to think about sustainability, okay? Uh, but what I want to talk about is, uh, so maybe before that, let me just talk about sustainability. There is a common misconception that when we talk about sustainability, we mean environment. Actually, sustainability, if you look at what is being defined by the United Nations, is around 19 different goals. If I can distill these goals down into three groups, they will be environmental sustainability, economic sustainability, and social sustainability. But Irony is that whenever we think about sustainability, we immediately think it's environmental sustainability. I am going to give you equal time to talk about environmental sustainability, social sustainability, and economic or financial sustainability of the household. If we make the country and the planet environmentally sustainable, and we all are very poor, and we don't have enough social interactions, and actually it is affecting women's life negatively, then I don't think we are a sustainable planet. We have to be sustainable in every dimension. That's the point I'm making. So there are 17 goals that have been set up by the United Nations Sustainability Development Organization that's that has actually 169 targets, okay? And that has been signed by all the countries around the world. I was recently in Dubai at COP28 
and all the discussions were about environmental sustainability, uh, very little on social and financial sustainability. So I, I want to kind of emphasize all aspects of sustainability. The other problem is when we think about sustainability, we think about top-down approach. What do, do corporations have to do? Corporations, when they hire, they should have women in the organization because women are needed labor pool. That's about social sustainability. Wages should be high. There should be no, they should not be exploiting their employees. That's also about social sustainability. Okay. Similarly, are they uh, adhering to the carbon emission standards or sulfur emission standards? Those are the kind of the self uh, environmental sustainability issues that corporations should be adhering to. So that's all we think about when we think about ESG ratings of companies. All we are measuring is the sustainability of companies. You know, we think about ESG, environment, social, and governance, uh, sustainability of companies. So I think we will not solve sustainability if we purely look at sustainability from a top-down approach, which is companies, societies, or even governments. We have to think from a bottom-up approach alongside the top-down approach, which means us as individuals have to take responsibility, okay? A lot of times you will see, I mean, these are just general examples I see all the time, that we will be sleeping with, an, with the air conditioner on at the temperature of 22, 21, 24 with a comforter on top of us. Okay, so I don't understand why do we need a comforter and also have the air condition at 22. We just remove the comforter, raise the temperature to 25, 26, 27, and actually we will be making the world a more sustainable place. Similarly, you see people driving very fast, expensive cars. Uh, sometimes you ask, I mean, I live in Singapore and in, uh, lots of people in Singapore own these fast cars. And Singapore is a, a small island, which is only 700 square kilometers. <clears throat> so I have no idea where you can go with a fast sports car. Most of the people who are buying these sports cars are keeping up with the Jones because the neighbor or the friend has a sports car. So you also need one. But clearly, it's not sustainable. Uh, environmentally, it's unsustainable car. Oh, one way is we need a much higher taxes for these cars in Singapore. So to discourage people from buying these expensive sports cars. Another example will be, I'm constantly getting into elevators and I will press from ground floor to go to my seventh floor to my office. And I will see students and other people getting into the elevator from the ground floor and pressing one. And I'm very confused. You're just going one floor up. Why do you need to take the elevator? Uh, it's part of it is just habit. They're so used to it. Part of it is they're not paying attention. They're paying attention to their phone. They're not looking at, they could just walk up the stairs, which could be good, good for their health. It could be good for the environment. And <clears throat> I mean, there are lots and lots of simple examples that we see in our daily life where we feel like we are not being uh, living the life in a sustainable uh, mindset. I mean, you go to restaurants, we'll eat the food, half the food we'll just waste and not even take it home. And <clears throat> we could easily bring it home, eat the next day or do something, but we choose uh, not to do those kind of things. Okay. So those are the kind of things I have in mind when I think about how to make us sustainable from the bottom up or the individuals taking responsibility of sustainability rather than we expecting the companies to kind of make the world a sustainable place, okay? So the way I think about it sustainable uh, in, in economic sense, uh, we have to think about the long-term growth, not just our uh, growth, but also our descendants. How, how will it affect the future generations? Uh, and we have to also think about what are the constraints that we put on it? I mean, think about concerns on this intergenerational welfare. Goes way back to 1928 which talks about discounting future utility is ethically indispensable and arises purely from a weakness of our imagination. 
we are discounting the future I mean, of our children and others because we want to satisfy our own utility. So unless we start thinking about uh, utility of our children and grandchildren, I think we are not doing justice to when we think about from a sustainability point of view. Okay, so I want to think about environmental, social, and financial choices that individuals make on a day-to-day -day basis and how that affects their sustainability, individual sustainability, okay? For example, if you're thinking about from an environmental point of view, a households all typically use utilities like uh, gas, electricity, water. They typically take transportation that could be public transportation, that could be uh, ride sharing like uh, Grab or Uber and others, or they could be making food choices every day. And if they are not making these food optimal choices, they're, they are clearly affecting sustainability. Um, for example, how do consumers choose between taking a car versus ride sharing versus public transportation? How do you choose between what you eat? Now, just to give you an example, if you actually eat uh, beef, your carbon footprint is around 20 times that if you eat other proteins like vegetarian or even fish. Let me say this again. If you actually eat beef, your carbon footprint is 20 times that of eating lentils uh, for, for lunch or dinner. Why? Why is the carbon footprint so high? Uh, typically cows, which are uh, animals that actually have multiple stomachs, actually cows have four stomachs, for them to digest the food that they eat, it takes them a long time, eight to 10 hours. In, in order to digest the food in, those, in that amount of time, they burp a lot. They burp a lot, which means they, uh, they throw out methane. And methane is 20 times more potent, you know, greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is. So if you're actually <coughs> emitting lots and lots of methane in, in Brazil or in Argentina to create livestock for the world's demand for beef, you are putting out lots, lots and lots of greenhouse gases that will be detrimental to the planet. Now, obviously transporting that, uh, that uh, uh, beef from Argentina or Brazil to Asia or other parts of the world itself also increases the carbon footprint. I'll give you another example. Many of you must have eaten Norwegian salmon. I mean, we all like the salmon that comes from Norway, but the Norwegian salmon is first flown from Norway to Thailand for descaling or removing all the bones from the salmon. And then from Thailand, it is flown to various parts of the world where it is consumed. So you can think about how much carbon footprint the Norwegian salmon has not just because it's uh, it's farmed or ca caught in Norway, but it's flown all the way to Thailand because of cost saving and then distributed around the world for consumers to consume. So these are examples of how our food choices affect our carbon footprint. Now let me think about financial sustainability. This was all about thinking about environmental sustainability. We make financial decisions all the time. Every day we are making some financial decision. Um, and unless we have financial education or financial counseling or financial understanding of the decisions we make, we will make suboptimal or wrong decisions. I mean, most of us are not financially literate and financially literate is not that easy of a job. I mean, many of you guys consume every day or save, try to save money for the future. Now, if you're not optimally deciding what, how much to consume versus how much to save, most of us want to participate in the stock market. Uh, so if you look at the data, around eight to 10% of the population only participates in the stock market. And even when they do participate, they only buy one or two stock. And the stock they typically buy is the stock of the company where they work. So most people are under participating in the stock market and under diversifying their portfolio in the stock market. That itself you can think about is very bad financial decision-making. Uh, you don't have a big diversified portfolio. A lot of us actually own a house 
and we make mistakes in choosing the right mortgage. Should we choose an adjustable rate mortgage versus a fixed rate mortgage? And should we have a, when should we refinance our mortgage? And what is the fee structure that we have to pay on these mortgages? So I can go down the list. There are hundreds of decisions we make on a regular basis that actually are suboptimal financially. When we think about social sustainability, that's another big area of research, is think about the gender wage gap. Women on average are paid lower wages for the same job they do, for the same education level, and for the same experience women have relative to men. Why should women be paid less for the, for the work they do? Women's education. In most countries, women don't get as high of an education as men do, and part of it could be culture, part could be other factors. So the question is, if we want to make a world a sustainable place, we have to worry about gender wage gap, women's education, protecting the labor force by giving them some minimum wage so, so that employers don't exploit their employees by giving them very low wages. Uh, other aspects about aging population. Do we have retirement safety for aging population? When the aging population retires, are we providing them sufficient, sufficient resources so that they can live till uh, they can have enough consumption and utility uh, till they die? So there's no loss in utility after retirement. You can think about income inequality and intergenerational mobility. Uh, the richer, rich people are getting richer and the poor people are getting poor we are, with time. You can look that in Indonesia. I mean, rich are just getting rich. And then the question is, how come the rich continue to get rich and poor don't move up the ladder? What kind of policies should we think about to create you know, intergenerational mobility? Uh, transportation, health, safety, and security. So there are tons of examples. I will go through a bunch of these kind of examples for financial sustainability, social sustainability, and environmental sustainability at the household level to actually address the sustainability question from the bottom up in the rest of my presentation rather than from the top down, okay? So one way I think about doing this is interacting all these questions of environmental, financial, and social sustainability with each other so that consumers can say, oh yeah, we can understand, or we can learn about these questions, for example, what is the effect of say minimum wages on household spending or change in environmental laws and policies on housing demand and prices and so on and so forth. Uh, so lots of things that people can do. It is something that is happening in Singapore, uh, trying to think about household sus sustainability. You can think about the social sustainability, the economic, the environment, and how we can interact that with the land and the sea and the various aspects, low carbon, reduced waste, adequacy of water and so on and so forth. And we need to address all of these factors to make Singapore a sustainable place. And this is a plan adopted by the government. Okay, let me kind of talk a little bit about measurement and then I will kind of spend the rest of my talk giving you examples. So if you think about financial sustainability, okay, financial sustainability, we have done a lot. And part of the reason we have done a lot is because we have started to measure who is sustainable and who is not sustainable financially. One way we have done that measurement is through creating a simple FICO score or a credit score, financial credit score of every individual. So when you go to a bank, the first thing they will do is pull a credit score on you and the bank will learn how sustainable you are as an individual, okay, financially. If you're financially savvy, financially good, if your score is six, seven, eight hundred versus 400, the bank knows that you know how to deal with financial markets and financial products, okay? Uh, but if we think about from a, a carbon point of view or environmental point of view, we don't have any such thing like a, a carbon scorecard for individuals. We have a, a scorecard, financial scorecard for individuals. So the first thing I've been kind of proposing 
and advocating is let's build a environmental scorecard for every individual. Now I'll tell you first how to build it, and then I will tell you why we should build it, how we will use it, okay? So now to build a carbon scorecard, we will need a lot of data on individuals. Now, where, where, where is the carbon footprint of individuals? Typically, the carbon footprint of individual comes from three aspects. Their food habits, their transportation habits, and the utilities, which is water, electricity, and so on and so forth. Now, all of that is typically being captured in some form of your payment. When you uh, buy your food on your credit card, debit card, or your app, your, you know, your, your uh, e-wallet on your phone, you will pay for this uh, food, either groceries or ready-made food delivered to your house. You're paying for all of these through some kind of a, either debit or electronic means. Very few of us pay for it by cash. Typically, people who pay for it by cash are on average poor, okay? So, I can capture all of your food spending on your financial transactions. When I think about your uh, utilities, also we pay for our water bill or electricity bill through our debit or credit card, and so I can capture it in your financial transactions. And so can I capture your transactions on your transportation. When you put petrol in your car, you will pay for it through your through your uh, cards, and then I will capture it. If you're buying a, a a metro ticket, I can also capture that. If you're paying for your grab with your uh, wallet, I can capture that. Hello, everyone. I think we're still having technical issue from Professor Agarwal's side. So we will wait for a few minutes until he rejoins to the Zoom meeting. Hi. Sorry, I don't know what happened. <laughs> Welcome back, Professor Agarwal. So I, I, I don't I don't know how it got disconnected. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you make me the host so I can share? Uh, we are still in the process of setting your uh host.
uh, can... how, how long was I disconnected? So I couldn't even track. <laughs> I think we just finished about the uh, proposing for making an individual scorecard for okay. uh, yeah, uh, social and environmental sustainability. The scorecard? Yes. Okay. Prof Summit, you should be able to share your screen now. Okay. I think I was on this slide. Yes, you're correct. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know how this disappeared. <sighs> you may continue. Yes. Sorry about that, everybody. So let me continue from where I was. So I would I my goal is to say let's build a, a environmental scorecard for individuals because we already have a financial scorecard. And the point is that, look, if we really want to solve the sustainability problem from ground up for the individuals, first is measuring. And we have to then <clears throat> build the scorecard for everybody. So we can collect the data of individuals, of their transportation, of their uh, food, and about their utilities from their financial records, their credit cards, their debit cards, this could also be from their e-wallets. And once I have that, I can then construct a scorecard. For example, do you eat a lot of meat? Do you eat beef? That should give you a, a higher carbon scorecard where your carbon footprint is higher. If you take public transportation, that should give you a lower scorecard. What is your electricity and water bill? That will depend and that will determine what is your uh, carbon score, scorecard or, uh, or sustainability scorecard from an environmental point of view. Once I have that, then life becomes easy for me to determine who has a big carbon footprint versus a small carbon footprint. And then also to change behavior, not just about measuring, but also change behavior. Now let me talk about how to use this credit, uh, this scorecard, carbon scorecard to change behavior. So the first thing would be to work with governments and tell governments that somebody who has a lower carbon scorecard should pay lower taxes, okay? So if you, if you lower your carbon scorecard, your taxes will be lower directly on your income tax. So that gives everybody an incentive to try to reduce their carbon scorecard, okay? The other thing I would say is that we should ask banks to give you a, a lower uh, interest rate on financial products that you're going to buy from the bank. For example, if you're going to get a mortgage or an auto loan or anything else that you get from a bank or a loan to start a small business, your uh, interest rate will be low on, lower if your carbon scorecard is low. So you can think that the carbon scorecard that we can build for individuals can be used by individuals to benefit themselves either from the government or through the banking sector. The banks right now are already moving in this direction. In many countries, I make the same presentation and I talk to bankers, I talk to governments, and they like this idea because they think, wow, we are already doing these carbon uh, credits to com companies and uh, other in institutions. Why not just do this to individuals? Okay, give them lower interest rate and give them tax credits by the government. Okay. So I can imagine how this carbon scorecard can be very useful. The other thing is right now, we are cross-subsidizing the poor people who typically take public transportation, who typically eat vegetarian food, or typically have very low electricity and, and, uh, and water bills because they don't sit in air conditions, are cross-subsidizing the rich people who drive Ferraris and actually eat beef. So the question is, why should the poor countries and individuals within a country be cross-subsidizing the rich people and rich countries? Why should America, because they eat a lot of beef, be, be cross-subsidized by India, who use, eats very little beef and mostly vegetarian? There is no reason, because why should there be this cross-subsidy? So that's one thing that we can remove, this cross-subsidy from across nations and within nations, from the poor to the rich. So the carbon scorecard will help solve many of these kind of problems. 
I also have an idea to build a social scorecard. I will not get into it at this point. Uh, I may come, if you have questions, I, I'm happy to bring this up at the end of the presentation in the Q&A. I also think of a SME scorecard, but let me now try to spend the rest of my time to go through a few examples of ideas on how to solve these problems. So I'm gonna start with environmental sustainability, then I'm gonna get into the social sustainability and then financial sustainability, okay? So <clears throat> when I think about environmental sustainability, how should we go about improving the environmental sustainability of individuals? Uh, I mean, look, when we think about energy consumption, water and electricity, the typical ways we think about reducing these things is through pricing. Look, if I increase the price of electricity or water, I am going to cause people to use less electricity and water. The other ways is behavioral, by nudging, by giving them some social nudges, by saying, look, if you don't do this, it's better for the environment, and that causing people to reduce their footprint. And other ways through uh, externalities. So I, I'm going to try to show you examples of studies that I've been doing uh, in, in NUS, trying to solve these problems, causing <laughs> individuals to reduce their environmental footprint. Okay. This is the first example. So what we were doing is in, in schools, in middle schools and high schools in Singapore, we randomly chose a bunch of these schools which are denoted by these uh, a triangle, a red triangle. And in these schools, we told the teachers to give students a reward if they can get their parents to reduce the water bill by 10%. So if you reduce the water bill by more than 10% for, for four months straight, you'll be eligible to win an iPad. Okay, something like that, a, a, a small gift. So then we said, let's look at the treated schools, which are these triangle schools, and some other schools which are not, uh, not being given this incentive to reduce the water uh, electricity bill, and then look if this incentive works to kids to reduce the water bill of their parents. Okay, so here is a simple graph. Before, before we started this experiment, for the first four months, we were measuring the electricity bill of the schools that were given the incentives and the schools that were not given the incentives. So if you look from month one to month four, the pattern is very similar of the electricity bill of the two, uh, the, the people who were living near these two schools. But then if you look after month five, that's when we did the treatment, is then they started collecting the bill from the kid, uh, students, you start seeing there is a divergence in the two lines, which means the red line, which is these triangular schools, the houses near those schools, the bill, electricity bill actually started to drop. Okay, you can see that starkly just from this simple graph that the gap between the blue and the red line is increasing. So which means the students in the, uh, in the schools around the the treated schools is reducing their electricity bill. Now the effect is not that big, it's around 1.8%. Now what 1.8% is huge, think about it. I mean, and we are saying on average, every family <coughs> living near these schools is reducing their water bill, sorry, electricity bill by 1.8%, okay? And we didn't even do anything. All we just said is to tell the uh, students, hey, can you bring the bill to the school? And if you do that, and if you reduce the bill by more than 10%, we will give you a lottery, okay? So this is one simple way, and we can do this in Indonesia, we can do this in, in Malaysia, we can do this in any country to get people, households and individuals to reduce their foot, carbon footprint, okay? Uh, there are peer effects. Let me not go into that. Let me give you a different example of water. So here, what we were doing is, we're looking at water usage within Singapore and how much how can we try to reduce the water usage. So first, to just give you background, on average, Singapore uses around 430 million gallons of water per day. That's a 
a lot of water and it's expected to double by 2060. Population will increase, uh, there will be climate change, days will be hotter and many other factors that will double the amount of water Singaporeans will be using in the next uh, <clears throat> 30 years. Okay. Now, there are many ways to solve the, climate, uh, the water problem. You can try to increase the supply of water by having more catchment areas in Singapore where you can catch the rainwater. You can import more water from Malaysia and other countries. You can create no new water or you can actually take the seawater and desalinate it and make it drinking water. Typically, these are very expensive ways to solve the water problem uh, uh, because the, uh, Singapore has a lot of catchment areas. You can bring water directly from Malaysia. Uh, you can actually recycle the water and so on and so forth. But I, as an economist, want to think about solving the water problem, not from the supply of water, but from the demand of water point of view. How can we change the demand or reduce the demand? The government also already has an objective from reducing the demand of water up from 165 liters per person per day to around 130 liters of water consumed per person per day. Now, if you think about it, we consume on average around 140 liters of water per person per day. That's a lot of water that we are consuming every day. The question is, can we reduce this water demand a little bit? The first obvious thing as an economist I think about is, how about we do some pricing? If we increase the price of water from say 13, uh, uh, from whatever number it is, here's the number, it went from $2.10 to $2.70. <clears throat> if you use less water and if from $2.60 to $3.60, if you use more than 40 cubic meters of water, then the question is, does this actually impact the demand for water or the usage of water? So the water price went up by 30% and 40% in Singapore, and we wanted to see how does this affect the usage of water, okay? So what we did is we collected the data of water usage for every apartment in Singapore. Let me say this again. We collected the data for every single apartment for a 10 year period at a monthly level. So I know every apartment, every individual, how much water they use every month uh, over the 10 years. So that gives me a lot of data to then analyze if I change the pricing of water, how much water demand or water usage will go down. So here is a way to kind of do this we kind of crunch this data statistically. And what we find is that after the announcement of the policy, the water demand or water usage went down by 5.8% for everybody whose price of water went up. So when prices went up, you demanded less water by around 6% on average perpetually. I mean, after that, for every month, your water demand went down by 6%. We can do some more work and show that there was some announcement effect, which is, but when the prices actually went up of water, that's when people started <coughs> using less water. So clearly this is important for us to reduce water demand, okay? So that's one way to, uh, to kind of change consumer behavior, uh, especially for a, such an important uh, product like, like water, to, re to reduce our carbon footprint or our environmental impact on the planet. <clears throat> can we do other things? Uh, can we actually change the piping? A lot of the times the piping that we use in the housing are really old, really inefficient, and that's why we waste a lot of water. So in Singapore, there was this policy. It's called the Home Improvement Program, which actually uh, says that if 80% of the people in a given building agree, then the government will come in and change the entire piping of the building to improve the efficiency of water supply, okay? And this will actually reduce the water that is coming in from your pipes to your uh, toilets, to your, uh, to your uh, showers and so on and so forth, and effectively help you reduce your water demand. 
So the setting is very interesting because if 79% of the people in a given building say, uh, we want to do this what home improvement or, or, or program, then it will not be done. But if 81% of the people say, let's do it, then the program goes through and they come in and change all the pipes and everything in the, <clears throat> in the building. So we exploited this thing, this the difference between the two and to see how do people actually change their water demand, okay? Oh, what happened? Uh, so here is uh, the an analysis we did. The water usage before the policy is constant, you can see from negative <clears throat> T minus nine to T zero, nothing is changing. You are using the same water. But once you change the fixtures in your house, the demand for water or the usage of water goes down by on average 3%. <clears throat> in the analysis we find is three and a half percent water usage going down, which is quite a lot. I mean, every household in the building that is being treated or going through this program <laughs> is reducing their water usage by three and a half percent, okay? We did a lot of more analysis in the paper to show that this is not driven by weather and other, other conditions in the data, okay? Here is just a simple set of regressions just to prove that what I was showing you in the graph is correct. And you can see, I mean, the amount of data we are using is a lot. We're using 98 million data points or observations to kind of estimate this effect, which is a effect of 3.5. 5% reduction in water usage. What's also interesting is you see this effect being very long lasting. It's not there just for a month or two months or a year. It's there for years after they change the pipes and people's consumption goes down of water. People who work in the environmental literature will typically argue, oh, these effects rebound one month, two months or six months later, people will actually start consuming more of these services rather than less, but what we are documenting is they consume less water perpetually or for the next 10 years, okay? Uh, so you can see there is lots we can do. I just showed you a few examples of how we can reduce your electricity and water bill simply by doing some nudging or changing the pipes or changing the pricing, <laughs> okay? There could be other things we can do. Uh, so is there a negative externality of uh, electricity consumption? You know, if you have these uh, 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 haze incidences that happen in Singapore every now and then, question is, what is the effect of that on electricity consumption and water consumption? Because everybody now wants to stay indoor and consume more electricity. So here we were looking at a very simple thing. If there are construction sites near your house, because you know, big cities are always having a lot of construction activities. So the question was, if there is a lot of construction going on in your neighborhood, you're sitting in your house, you're going to shut down all the windows and how much that does affect the water usage in your apartment. Other studies we have looked at the effect of haze pollution uh, and its effect on water and electricity usage. Let me talk one more example in terms of um, uh, environmental sustainability, and then I will try to move on to social sustainability and financial sustainability, okay? Now, sea level rise is a big issue. Now, all of you guys are in Jakarta, you are well aware that how big of an issue sea level rise is, especially for Jakarta. So Jakarta is a city which is populated by close to 20 million people. Uh, the fact that 20 million people live there and get use the water every day from the underground sources, the city itself is sinking. The, the land is sinking because the water that was keeping up that thing is, is being removed. So the soil is slowly sinking in. So that's one aspect that is happening in Jakarta. The second thing is because of the global warming and mel melting of the ice around the polar ice caps, in, in the north and south, we are seeing sea levels to rise. So Jakarta is facing this dual problem. One is that the, the massive overpopulation of the city is causing the water table to go down and the, and the soil to sink, but also because of sea level rise, 
there is a rise in, uh, rise of the tides and so that will create a lot of the coastal areas in Jakarta to be underwater now the government is proposing to spend few billion dollars in Jakarta to build seawalls around the city to protect the city they are also trying to move the capital away from Jakarta uh, to Kalimantan to kind of reduce the population of Jakarta to deal with this problem of the sinking soil levels in Jakarta. So you can see having this is a huge problem when you have sea level rise and soil levels sinking. Uh, we expect that in another 50 to 100 years, uh, sea, uh, sea levels could rise by as much as 0.5 to one uh, meter, which is significant. I mean, one meter rise in sea level can actually re just reduce lots and lots of population. It's expected that will, this will affect over 1 billion people by 2020, uh, 2050, okay? So the question is, what does rising sea levels do to livelihood or wealth of individuals? If you actually own a house near the ocean and if their sea level is rising, what will happen to your house price? Uh, so this is what we wanted to study. So obviously I don't have the data for Jakarta, so I can't do it. I have data for Singapore, so I can actually study this and kind of estimate what's the effect on house prices. So the Singapore prime minister had announced that they will invest around $100 billion to protect Singapore against sea level rise, and they will spend this money over the next 100 years. So the question was, how much does this affect actually uh, impacts house prices in Singapore. So when the prime minister made his speech, he actually said these areas in red will be the areas that will be affected by sea, sea level rise. And so the question I had in mind is, if that's the case, that sea level will be rising, then these red dots will be affecting, then what will happen to the house prices in these areas relative to the house prices that are not being affected. So you can look right there, they're green dots and they're red dots. So I'm looking at houses that are comparable next to each other. And then trying to show that if you're close to the sea level rise area, how much does this negatively affect your house price? So here is a graphical representation that because of the speech itself, house prices went down by 6%. So if we looked at the sale of the houses after the speech made by the prime minister, house prices in that area went down by 6%. So imagine you have a house that is worth say $5 million. Now your house is worth less by around $250,000. That's a lot of money if you are actually living there in that neighborhood, that your house now became less priced are cheaper by $250,000 just because we expect that in 100 years, sea levels will rise and your house will be underwater. This is not that interesting to me. What's more interesting to me is trying to see, because at the same time, the prime minister said that we will invest $100 billion to protect against sea level rise. So what we did is we looked at the areas where the prime minister said they will build the wall and do other innovations, technological innovations to protect Singaporeans against sea level rise. Now, what you see is, as because of the speech by the prime minister, the negative effect on house prices is only 2%. Remember earlier I showed you 6%, now it's only 2%. So the speech itself was able to protect house prices significantly by around 4% because the government said, we are going to spend money. Now this is analogous to what uh, Jakarta has done. The government in Jakarta has said they will build a seawall in Jakarta to protect the land and protect the area against seawater coming into Jakarta. Imagine how, how, what is the impact of that on house prices in Jakarta. Now, nobody has done that, but clearly you can do that kind of analysis and estimate how much Jakarta is benefiting 
from the wall being built in Jakarta. Okay, so the point of this study, um, these kind of studies is to show how we can actually help uh, the countries think in terms of environmental sustainability uh, by, by, for individuals, okay? Uh, okay. <clears throat> we have done lots and lots and lots of studies looking at the effect of sunshine, temperature or, or mor morbidity, uh, and so on and so forth. Let me spend a couple minutes on food because this is really important. So if you actually look at a greenhouse gas for different food categories, you will actually see different food categories have different effect on greenhouse gases. If you look at beef versus mutton and other things, versus if you look at lentils, the greenhouse gas effect is relatively tiny. People who have done this kind of surveys and ask, uh, what do you think uh, the effect of, uh, uh, of individual action is on reducing, uh, uh, reducing uh, carbon emissions? Most people typically will talk about consume less energy, conserve water, and so on and so forth, but they rarely talk about you know, food. They don't think their food habits has anything to do with the environment. Uh, here is what people said, uh, what do, are the things that your individual actions will affect uh, in terms of climate change? Most of them will say switching from driving a big car to taking public transportation. And they will say, look, this it will have a huge effect on the environment. But if you, if you ask, look at the data and say, if you eat vegan diet or vegetarian diet, people don't think that this will affect the environment significantly. But the fact is that actual effect of vegan diet is huge on the environment. So you can see people's misunderstanding or misperception of diet on the environment is, is misguided because they don't think their diet has much to do with the environmental footprint that they create. If you buy local food, if you waste less water, so water, food, transportation, again, are very important factors in reducing your environmental footprint. Uh, <clears throat> there are lots and lots of things people have looked at. Eating meat, percentage mentioning behavior as a cause of global warming. Eating meat has a very small footprint. Most of people think driving a car, <clears throat> uh, actually, uh, consumer products, electricity have huge footprint, but eating meat does not. Whereas actual data shows that eating meat has a huge carbon footprint. So you can see there is a huge disconnect in the perception and reality of food consumption and its effect on our environment. Okay. Um, let me not talk more about environmental sustainability. Let me then switch to talking about um, social sustainability. I mean, I have lots of studies on environmental sustainability on food. I'm not. Go I'm going to skip some of these things. Now, the problem is when we, whenever we think about sustainability, immediately we think about environment, and we never walk away from environment. We only think about sustainability as an environmental issue. But I want to tell you guys that social and financial sustainability is equally important if we think about household sustainability. Households cannot be sustainable purely by having a lower carbon footprint. They also have to be sustainable socially. Okay, when I think about social sustainability from a household perspective, I think about two aspects. One is about social equity and sustainability of social sustainability in the community. <clears throat> when I think about equity, I think within generation, between generations, providing access to everybody, the same thing, women versus gender, gender equity, all of those things. When I think about sustainability of the community, I think about diversity in the community, building social capital, participation by members of the community, all of those, okay? So you can think about pro providing land, labor, and capital. This is what households provide. And in exchange, they're getting, say, wages and uh, profits and rents. And the question is, will, can we make it in a way that households actually gain, especially the poorer households, okay? 
Um, I'm going to skip these slides on wage inequality. So I'm going to talk about something more important to me, which is about schooling. So if you think about, if you ask a question, why do girls don't go to school? Okay. Many people will say it's cultural, it's religious, it's ethnical, um, their social norms of why girls don't go to school. But if you look at the data, the two main reasons girls don't go to school is toilets and, men's, and uh, uh, pads, sanitary pads. If we actually provide girls uh, toilets, because girls need privacy to go to, uh, to a toilet, boys don't need it. Now, when you don't provide this privacy or when you don't provide them sanitary pads, then girls end up dropping from school because they feel uncomfortable in the school. And when girls go to school, uh, drop out three, four days a, a week, uh, sorry, a month, it makes, uh, makes them fall behind in grades. And as a result, they actually uh, do poorly and the parents say, oh, I'm wasting my money on the girls. Now you might say, oh, this is a poor country problem. Uh, this issue of sanitary pads, it only happens in villages, in big cities, this is not a problem. California and the UK recently passed laws actually to provide sanitary, free sanitary pads for all girls in all of California and all of UK. So you can think about how big of a problem providing simple things like sanitary pads is in girls' education, okay? So what I did is, I said, can we work with the government to providing free sanitary pads? And then what is the effect of that on girls' education? Okay. So there is this program in Kerala, which is called the ShePad program. This program was launched in 2015, and it was essentially providing free sanitary pads to all girls in the school. You can think about like a vending machine a sanitary pad vending machine that was installed in schools in Kerala and providing these free sanitary pads. And then what we wanted to study is what is the effect of that on girls' dropout rates from school? If I provide these sanitary pads, are girls less likely to drop out from school? So what this, this program was done, it's, it was implemented over the years from 2015, 16, 17, 18, different schools adopted this program and got the vending machine uh, in their school and it provided free sanitary pads to all the girls. So here is the map of Kerala and then it shows that at different age, age uh, years, different schools in different locations got this free sanitary pads. Then what I did is, is I collected all the enrollment data for 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 Kerala from 2013 to 2020, and I wanted to see what is the effect of this providing this free sanitary pads on girls' education outcomes, okay? So here is what we did. Uh, let me show you in a graphical sense what the results look like. If you look at grade five and grade six, there is no effect of providing free sanitary pads on girls' education or dropout rate. But in grade seven, this is the time, the first time a girl uh, gets menstruation, the dropout rate for the girls drop, goes down by 35%. 35% girls are less likely to drop out of school just because we provided free sanitary pads for girls in those schools. Uh, you can look at grades seven, eight, nine, 10, we see some effect in those grades as well but the, the effect happens in the first time the girls go for menstruation and we provide them free sanitary pads. You can see this here, these, these effects are massive, okay? Next thing we looked at their examination outcomes. They are more likely to appear for exam, they are more likely to pass the exam, and they are more likely to pass the exam with distinction if we provide them <clears throat> free sanitary pads in the school. So having a simple, simple, simple intervention, like providing free sanitary pads, can have huge effects on social uh, sustainability of girls going to school and getting educated and not dropping out of school and then getting married very young or being exploited. Now they can be very productive members of society 
they may still want to be married and do whatever, but <clears throat> at least they are not dropping out of school because they, they didn't have access to something very basic like sanitary pads. Okay. We have looked at many, many other things in the social domain. Uh, if you think about people when they when we consume our food, we pay a lot of attention to where the, our pro food is coming from and what is the ESG rating of the company that is providing us that food. So we wanted to look at this kind of stuff. In China, we collected a lot of micro data from a bank on consumers spending habits. And we looked at if the consumer knows where their food comes from, and if the, if the company that is providing their food has some problems, social problems, that they're not dealing with their employees very well, are they exploiting their employees, are they getting in trouble socially with their, with their clients, do consumers punish these companies by not buying their food? So are they, do they have child labor practices? Are they uh, polluting environmentally much more? And do then individuals uh, buy less food from that. Imagine you buy butter for a certain brand or jam or, or clothing, jeans, and then you found out that the jeans were made by uh, child labor. And then you said, I'm not going to buy the jeans from this company. So that's the kind of an idea we had in mind. Do consumers punish companies that exploit socially uh, uh, reprehensive behavior? Okay. So what we then did is we looked at data from uh, for around 1 million consumers in China and followed them on a daily basis on their spending behavior, okay? Here are the types of punishments that the Chinese government was giving to the companies who actually acted badly. So if there were quality related issues in the company, false advertisement, fire safety issues, illegal operations and so on and so forth, we tracked all these penalties and then uh, if they were getting a penalty like this at the company, we wanted to see what was happening to the spending behavior. Here is a simple graph that shows that if you were punished as a firm, your spending, the spending behavior of the consumer at your firm will drop from around $250 to around $150. So we are punishing companies because they are acting badly. This is about social responsibility of the companies. When they're not socially responsible, consumers make them pay. If you're looking at a company that is not punished, you see no change in spending behavior of that company. So the point again is that consumers, when, when we think about social sustainability, consumers can play a big role in that, in that to make sure that companies are socially sustainable or responsible, okay? Uh, these are just regressions that showing the same effect in terms in the in this you can see right after the companies are punished the spending goes down as a consumer okay here is another example <laughs> so look uh, we know there is a wage gap between men and women women for the same education same experience same uh, you know educate uh, education or uh, uh, things same job are paid less than men. There's a long literature that has documented that, that women get paid less. First, they're not hired. And secondly, if they're hired, they're paid a, a lower wage. And the question is, why so? There are lots of theories and lots of arguments. One argument is that uh, employers think that they, women will have a baby. And because they're going to have a baby, the employer says, why should I pay her so much? Because she will leave the job uh, sooner or later and then she may not come back and I'm wasting my money. So I should not hire her. If I'm hungry, hire her, I should pay a lower wage. People have tested this day in the data. So we wanted to see if this is true. So we were looking at this two child policy in, in China because China had this one child policy and now China said, we're gonna have two child policy. So we'll allow women to have more than one child. And the question is when the employers, when they find out that the woman can have a second child, now do the employers pay them less wages and punish them because they are more likely to have a second child. And if you look at the wages I'm plotting here of the, of, of the women versus men, 
you can see wages actually go down by around 2% relative to men on average in, in these companies. I can break the data by age group and you see the women who are more likely to be having two child by age group are being punished more so in this category. Fresh graduates, because these fresh graduates are not likely to have the second child, they're still very likely to be that having the first child versus seasoned women who have been in the job for a long time, they are more likely to have a second child and their effect of re reduction in wages is higher. So you can see the data is very clear that companies punish women who are more likely to have a second child. Now, again, this is about social sustainability, that why are companies allowed to do that? And we are why are we individuals and governments not taking action against such behavior? Yeah. Um, let me skip some of this. So I don't know how much time I have, but I will try to just talk about then quickly on um, financial sustainability and then maybe take some questions from you guys, okay? Now, financial sustainability is very complex. Look, uh, most of us are dealing with getting payday loans or, or uh, micro loans are dealing, getting a, dealing with fintech companies and paying interest rates of 70, 80, 90% on these products. Uh, we are suboptimally allocating money on our retirement accounts. We don't know how to deal with mortgage refinancing. Every day we make a financial mistake. It's just true in the data. So the question is, how do we get people to make less mistakes? <clears throat> Let me show you some examples that I've been looking at. So think about a very simple example. I offer you guys two different credit cards. I offer you a credit card with 12% interest rate and $20 fee, or a credit card with 15% interest rate and no fee. Which one will you choose? Now, the answer is simple. If you expect to borrow, then you will choose card one. If you don't expect to borrow, then you should choose card two because Interest rate can be 200%. If you don't expect to borrow, it doesn't matter. So the interest rate is irrelevant to you. Uh, but if you're expecting to borrow, then you should pay a small fee, reduce your interest rate and benefit yourself in that, in that setting, okay? So if I told you that, <clears throat> do consumers choose optimally? So we looked at this in a bank in America where we looked at data for 150,000 consumers, we find that 40% of the consumers make a mistake and choose the wrong credit card. 43% of the consumers do not understand which card to choose and they choose the wrong card. The good news here is that the mistakes as they grow bigger, the fraction of people who choose the wrong credit card is very small. If the mistakes are more than $100, the people who choose the wrong card is only 2.9%. But strictly speaking, 43% of the people do make a mistake in choosing the wrong card. Okay. <clears throat> do they switch? As I said in, in earlier here, that you can switch the card at any time. Only 3.8% of the people switch the card. So they make a mistake, but they're less likely to switch to the right card. That itself tells you that they don't, uh, they're not paying much attention to these financial products. The next question then is, who makes these mistakes? Uh, and do they learn from these mistakes? So here you will see the data that actually when you start a relationship with a bank, you are paying around $150 in fees to the bank, but over time you pay a fee of around only $50. So you do learn from your, uh, from your mistakes from the past, and over time, you will make less financial mistakes when you're dealing with a bank or a credit card company or any financial institution. Then the question I was asking is, who makes mistakes? Do the old people make mistakes or do the young people make mistakes? And here we find that the young and the old are more likely to make most of the financial mistakes in the data and not the middle age group. The middle age group makes very little mistakes. And if you think about it, why do old and young make mistakes? And here is the idea that when you are very young, you have the highest cognitive ability. 
okay? But with age, from age 20 on, your, fun, your cognitive ability or your IQ keeps dropping in a straight line till age 90. But your, uh, your experience actually goes up with age. So the point is that this performance, the peak performance is a combination of your cognitive ability or your analytical capital and your experiential capital. And it kind of forms this inverted U-shaped pattern that at some middle age growth, you make the best financial decisions. In the data, we find that the best financial decisions you make is at age 53, okay? So I've shown you a few examples of how consumers make mistakes, what kind of mistakes do they make, and how we can kind of fix them. Uh, this one is slightly more complicated, so I'll skip this. Uh, maybe think about peer effects. Most of the time when we make financial mistakes, we make it because we are influenced by our friends and family. Uh, your friends, I mean, we know this, peer effects ma matter a lot. Uh, our peers uh, make us drink, make us smoke, make us uh, get, do many, many bad habits in our life. So do, also, do they also make us consume badly? So this is the question we were asking. Do I look down and look, uh, find that my neighbor drives an expensive car, then because they drive an expensive car, do I also try to buy a more expensive car or do they go on expensive vacations? Does that have changed my behavior of taking more expensive vacations? So those are the kind of, kind of questions I was trying to ask, uh, ask and answer in the data. Okay, so we were looking at building by building what is happening to consumer behavior. Okay, sorry, my son is also there, so he's gonna make some noise in the background. <laughs> okay. uh, excuse me, sir. Yes. Yeah, uh, we are about to run out of time, so if okay, you... I can stop here actually. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Professor Agarwal, for your very insightful presentation. There are a lot to take. So uh, to conclude, there are three main points in sustainability that we need to take notes of from uh, environment, financial, and social, and uh, which is uh, we are still in progress to achieve many of those aspects in sustainability. And especially we can start by uh, household su sustainability because in household we consume everything from uh, financial factors, environment factors, and also we in, uh, join social occasion as well. So uh, if any questions, uh, if any students want to ask question, you can uh, raise your hand or put in the chat box, maybe. I am still waiting. Okay, we have a few questions. I think we have two questions. For, uh, first one is from Marcella, which is my students. Hello, Marcella. <laughs> Marcella said, I want to ask, according to the existing uh, wait, topic about sustainability as a major trend in consumer behavior, uh, what exactly are the right steps so that the consumer behavior can be sustainable, both in the short and long term. Because what we know is that consumer behavior changes in terms of time, generation, or age, yes. in terms of increasingly sophisticated technological developments. That's very true. Like, look, I think uh, what I was pointing out that look, uh, consumer behavior is very important for us to understand in terms of their utility, in terms of their food, in terms of their transportation. And if we can change their behavior by pricing, by giving them incentives, nudging them to do the right thing, telling, making them aware. Most consumers don't even know that their food habits are a big cause of the environmental sustainability problem. Most of us don't know about financial sustainability problems, what we are doing, what kind of mistakes we are making, or the social sustainability. I didn't have time. But think about women don't climb the corporate ladder. How do we, how can we get women to climb corporate ladder? This is about social sustainability. How do we make sure women are actually at par with men when running corporations, when running companies, or when running in governments? 
So that's how, uh, and how do we provide the right, um, right settings? Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you for the answer, Professor. Uh, Marcella, do you still have question about uh, what you asked before? If not, I think we can continue do, to the second question from Ivan Belfa. Ivan asks, are there generational differences in the importance placed on sustainability in consumer behavior? Yes. So there were some slides I skipped, but the thing is that intergenerationally, we know there are big differences in sustainability. Uh, the younger generation is paying more emphasis on sustainability right now than the older generation. So if you look at you know, the people who are in their early teens and 20s, they care a lot about taking public transportation, not using plastic bottles, using recyclables, and all of that, <clears throat> then individuals who are older. So clearly they are much more cognizant and conscious of their carbon footprint. Socially, I think they are not uh, doing too well. So I think we need to focus more on social and financial sustainability for the young people than their environmental sustainability. Professor Ivan, is it a uh, question? Yes. Okay. So I think that's all. No more question from students. Okay. Oh, there is one more from Maviola. Hi, Prof. I would like to ask how do economic factors such as pricing and affordability influence cost consumers' willingness to choose sustainable options? Now, that's a very important question because economists will always think about pricing uh, as an important factor in I mean, affordability. Imagine that beef is very cheap. Then even if the beef's carbon footprint is huge, consumers will continue to eat beef. The problem is right now we don't price the sustainability aspect in the price of beef or luxury cars. We only charge luxury cars higher price because they are made are more expensive. The cars right now, luxury cars should be priced 20, 30 times more, sorry, 20, 30% more than they are currently if we want to discourage usage of such cars. Similarly, beef, it should be priced two times, three times higher if we want to incorporate the sustainability aspect of eating beef. Similarly, you know, we don't do that in, in electricity, water, everything else we do in life and that will change consumer behavior. Okay, thank you for your answer. It's very interesting and insightful answer. So uh, there is no more question from the participants. I would like to also ask a question uh, related to Mefiola's uh, question and your answer before, because uh, I once watched a documentary about the reduction of options sustainable options available in retail markets supermarkets especially in the us due to the global uh, economic crisis that's going on right now what's your uh, opinion about it yeah i think this is the problem that governments uh, because they realize that there is some uh, some financial hardship on the consumers they immediately cut down on uh, programs that will ha have a better effect on the environment or socially. So I think the governments try to do this trade-off from providing financial sustainability at the cost of environmental sustainability. I don't think there should be you know, uh, 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 zero-sum game. I think we can win on all aspects. We should try to find ways how to win on social, financial, and environmental sustainability versus oh, we have to sacrifice on the environment or social issues. Thank you so much for your answer. One last question from Josephine, because I think it's still related. Hello, Prof. Can you identify specific industries or sectors where sustainability has significantly impacted consumer behavior? Yeah, I mean, that's a very important question because, look, there are lots of industries that are doing very good, positively affecting. Uh, but obviously there are industries which are in coal or oil, those are actually having negative effect. 
food. I mean, if you think about uh, importing your food from Brazil, or if you're importing salmon from Norway, those have much higher sustainability or carbon footprint than you would have otherwise. So you have to be, you have to know this idea of from farm to table, whatever you're consuming could be uh, 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 food versus uh, utilities versus transportation. Where is it coming from? And what is the true carbon footprint <clears throat> of that consumption? And how do I make sure I can reduce my carbon footprint of that? So you can look industry by industry, you can look by sector by sector, region, whatever, and you can reduce it. For, I mean, I, the example I was doing that when car companies get punished, consumers respond by not buying and spending at that company anymore. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor, for answering all the questions from our participants. So before we end our session today, I would like to present a plaque of appreciation. Uh, Ms. Mega as operator, maybe you can help. So I would like to present a plaque of appreciation to you, Professor Agrawal, for the opportunity in sharing your expert. Hello. Hello. Um, hello, I'm sorry, Prof. I think yeah. we have an internet connection problem here. Okay, no it's problem. <laughs> Thank you so much, Prof. It's, it's Thank you. such a very insightful session. I'm I glad. I hope everybody liked it and enjoyed it and it was worth it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Oh, here. I would like to convey our biggest thanks to our honorable guest lecturer, Professor Samit Agarwal, and all NUS Business School team um, for our opportunity. Yes? Uh, please, I, I think Prof just log off. Uh, Ms. Debra, can we invite Prof again? Maybe we can have uh, our photo session first before we end the session. Uh, let me try and reach him because uh, I've only been able to contact him on email. But um, if not, maybe in the interest of time, do we want to take this offline? Okay. Let me try and invite him. You give me two more minutes. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Debra. Miss Ninis, hello, Miss Ninis. Can you hear me? Yes, Steph. Yeah, I think the picture we already took it locally before we have connection error. I think Miss Mix, <laughs> can you check? Yes. Oh, okay, we have not. Are we still waiting for Professor Agarwal, Taninis? <laughs> Hi, this is Deborah. Uh, please give us some time because I've just dropped him a quick email. I'm not sure if he will be responding, but how much time do we have more for the photo taking? Only a few minutes. Okay, uh, give me some time. I will get back to you. Okay, we will wait. Thank you.
Hello, Miss Deborah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Uh, so we will take the group pictures now, and we can edit professor's pictures later offline. Okay. Um, I've just reached out to him, but if he manages to join, I think we still need like maybe one or two more minutes. But perhaps we can proceed with the group photo, um, as you're taking the screenshots, and yeah, we could go with your suggestion as well. Yeah, thank you so much, Deborah, because uh, some of the students will have to join another class after this. Yes, okay. we understand. Thank you. So sorry about this. Yeah. It's okay. It's the typical internet problem. So we will start our group pictures. Students, please turn on your cameras. Uh, Miss Operator, Miss Widya, please help. Three, two, one, smile. Second slide. Three, two, one, smile. Last slide. Three, two, one, smile. Okay, that's all uh, our session for today. I would like to convey our biggest thanks to our honorable guest lecturer, Professor Agarwal, who has just left uh, the Zoom meeting, to Miss Debra and her team from NU, uh, NUS Business School. And also for all LSPR lecturers and Londoners for attending our session today. Please do not forget to fill in your attendance that uh, has been shared on the chat box. Stay healthy, stay safe, have a nice day, and bye everyone. Thank you, Miss Stephanie. You're welcome. Thank you, Miss. Thank you, Miss Debra. Thank you, Miss Stephanie. Thank you, Irpo. Bye, my mom. Thank you, my mom. Bye, guys. Thank you. Oh,